This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, I talk to composer, educator, and for 19 years, the new music critic at the Village Voice, Kyle Gann, author of No Such Thing as Silence, John Cage's 433. the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. Kyle Gann is a composer and associate professor of music at Bard College, the former longtime new music critic at the Village Voice, and the author of No Such Thing as Silence, John Cage's 433. Kyle, welcome to the program. Thanks. Glad to be here. I think the awareness of 433 is pretty high, but the tendency is that people hear it described by whoever as simply four minutes, 33 seconds of silence. Now, what is, what, how can we best nuance that? Because, of course, it's, it, it is that in a way, but it's also more. What would you immediately add to that very brief description? Well, I think an important thing is that it is in three movements, that it's a, it has a kind of form imposed on it, and that it is normally, you know, it's kind of a theatrical performance situation, when it's performed live, people are sitting there, and the and the uh, performers are sitting there, not doing what you expect them to do. So there, there's a theatrical aspect of it to it, and also kind of a classical music form imposed on it. Do you consider it then to be a piece that exists, sort of in? I don't know if this is kind of a loaded word. In, in its purest form, a live piece rather than a recorded one. Yeah, I think, I mean, sure, uh, Cage himself didn't like recording as much, and he considered it, you know, above all an, an act of listening. He he grew to the point where he felt that you could do it without any performers present, that you could just that you could just sit there and, and sort of enjoy your own performance of it. But it was, and I still think it remains for most people, the important thing about it is that it does happen live. And it is kind of a negation of expectations, and it's kind of, it's kind of important that the the experience of it being whatever uh, whatever sounds you hear in the whatever environment you find yourself in during a performance. Now, do you think that the piece still retains? the capacity to surprise that it had when it debuted? I mean, of course, no piece could entirely, but how much does right. it retain that? I, you know, every new generation discovers it, and a lot of people find it inspiring for one reason or another. Um, I think if you, if you do it live, so many people are, you know, it's the kind of, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's the kind of piece that once you hear about it, you feel like you've kind of experienced it. <laughs> which is true of a lot of conceptual art and conceptual music. And it's not really true. I mean, you really do need to sort of go through it, but so many people today, if, they, if you put it on a program, they know what to expect. Uh, and in fact, the first time I performed it, I, I, I've al- I re- always regretted that I explained the piece beforehand because I kept myself from finding out what would happen if I didn't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, you you were able to say before, or you said before, you know, be prepared, because I'm not going to play anything for four minutes, right. 33 seconds. Right. Now, there, was there a reaction to that, or did they just say, oh, okay, well, now we know. And now no, we'll just... every, yeah, everybody everybody was very polite about it. It was, it was, it was my friends and their parents and teachers. And, <laughs> and this, this gets into a bigger issue in conceptual music, which is that which is the issue of whether or not you're going to explain the concept behind it and how much how much mm-hmm. effect that has on the listening the listening to it. Now first I'll get this clear. It sounds like you you now find that that explanation not, didn't necessarily kill it in a way but k- killed part of it for the audience. Well, yeah, because when I when I did it it was 1973, the piece wasn't nearly as famous as it, as it is now. You know, it was in an, it was in an academic atmosphere. It was not really a public performance. At the first public performance, of course, people got very upset and angry. But I've also uh, read people saying that 
when that when the piece is performed, the audience seems to make more noises than they would ever make in any other situation. More of the sort of audience rustling noises? Yeah, something like that. Although when the BBC orchestra played it on the radio, they had a live audience there. And I, and I thought it was the, very, the funny thing was that people coughed between movements just as they would in a regular symphony, <laughs> which seems kind of peculiar because if you're just listening to whatever sounds happen, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you go ahead and cough? So. But then there's also, there's also the element of, I wonder if I wouldn't wait as well because any cough that I make during 433 is going to be heard and, and focused on more than it would be yeah. a cough during any other any other piece with, you know, sounds being played. Well, I think it's also significant, and I don't, Cage wouldn't agree with this, I don't, I don't think, but the first performance of it was an outdoor performance in Woodstock, and, uh, you know, the sounds were very lovely. It was all nature and, you know, trees and rain on the roof and things like that. How much is the, how much do we know about Cage's intent as far as it being in an environment like that outdoor, that outdoor setting where, se- where sounds are more likely to bleed into it versus, say, a very controlled indoor environment where you might usually hear a classical concert. It, it seems deliberate in reading the account in your book that he would set it outside, but what, did he have any opinions, do we know, about where it should be? I think he wouldn't have had any opinion because, uh, to take a, kind of an analogous example, there was his piece for... 12 radios, Imaginary Landscape Number 4, and when it was first performed, it was done late at night, and most of the radio stations had cut off for the day, as they did back then, and so the piece was very quiet, and some people considered that a failure, that they didn't really hear the piece, but Cage thought thought it was just fine, or, or claimed that he did. And they heard something, nonetheless, because the, there's, you still get some sort of sound over a radio that's, whose station has gone off, correct? Not sure back then. <laughs> yeah, that was, that's a you good know, point. that was before the before all day radio, I think. So But even if you have a radio turned on and it's not tuned to anything broadcasting anything, you'll still get kind of that faint sort of not necessarily static, but you'll get those you'll you'll it'll receive something, not necessarily anything intentionally broadcast though. Well, I don't know. There the reputation of that performance was that it was that it was very quiet because uh-huh. the stations weren't on, so Indeed, and now I want to I want to get an idea as well. You mentioned your own performance of 433 and how it was about 20 years after the debut of the piece and how the piece wasn't even still all that known when, the t- when you were playing it. So it's known seemingly universally now. What happened between when you, when you performed it then and now when everybody knows about it? Cage became much more famous because of his books. And in 1973, I think... They had become famous in the world of the performing and visual arts, but hadn't quite spread to the culture at large yet. You know, I think I think Cage's celebrity has simply grown in the intervening time, and you know, certainly it it gets well, it it gets it has been introduced through academia, and a lot of people have learned about it that way. But there have also been a lot of homages to 433 from rock bands, and I was kind of astonished at the number of rock bands who had included silent tracks on their records to in homage to that. And I'm still, I've even found out about new ones since the book came out. And so, you know, if you listen to those bands, that, you know, that piece comes up in uh, discussions of pop music and sort of mass culture context. Uh, Yoko Ono and, and John Lennon did a kind of homage to it on one of their records that would have been in the late 60s, I guess. It's been distributed by artists who brought it into more mass culture context. There's even a cartoon that I use in the book that that talks about it. Oh, yes, that was was surprisingly... It was surprisingly early as well. Now, which oh, the cartoon you mean with the with the karaoke singer who's not yeah, singing anything? Yeah, there was one with the karaoke singer trying doing four thirty three as his karaoke selection. <laughs> and what I also found fascinating was the cartoon from the I believe the thirties. So it predates yeah. it obviously, but the the one with the kid who who has a score written entirely of rests, you know, song of the yeah. Sphinx, I think he calls it. And that yeah. that was also it shows that idea was was floating around in at least some humorous capacity before Cage took hold of it? Well, it floated around in a lot of ways, because it was also, as I talk about, the 
Cage had the idea of using 433. I think his original idea for it was to use it as a replacement for Muzak so you could get some silence in the middle of a Muzak selection, but somebody else had already had the same deal, same idea of doing a silent jukebox record. <laughs> and I found, I found that fascinating as well. You know, with the word Muzak and the kind of associations we put to it today, there is a, there's a very specific kind of sensibility that you get and it seems it seems like a modern one a sort of you you picture like a a 70s soul song a stripped of the vocals and re, redone in in some sort of inoffensive instrumental way for example what what was the muzak situation like when john cage was saying we ought to insert this between between these tracks we hear in public well it was they would do kind of light jazz classics instrumentals. They always the Muzak Corporation made its own music. They were either three minutes long or four and a half minutes long, depending on the size of the record, which is where the original length of, of 433 came from. Oh, they were they were swing era standards, lightly orchestrated or, or played by on very mild instruments. And it's difficult to imagine today, but I've read this with other musicians, how, how threatening Muzak seemed in the 1940s when it was just catching on to musicians. Musicians were horrified by it, thought it was going to put them out of work, thought it was a degradation of music. And, you know, today we can't imagine protesting Muzak in any, any way that would get rid of it. <laughs> but... Back, but for that generation, it was a it was a huge intrusion into their lives. People were suing them for playing it on on public public transportation, and uh, you know law, lawsuits arose about it. People thought it was some kind of communist mind control. <laughs> Are these responses the context we can put Cage's idea in as far as, well, why don't we just put silence between them? Was that his own his own way of responding to this threat, shall we quote them as saying? Yes, it, I think it was, because before he got into Zen, he was, he, was a, he was politically very left, and he was distrustful of corporations, and he would, he would rail against uh, time, life, and Coca-Cola, and it was talk about with, and during World War II, he thought there was nothing good in anything big in society, and that corporations were destroying our freedoms. And so I think it was. I think it originated as a protest against corporations. And then later, when he got into Zen, I think the the kind of rationale for it changed. And he didn't really he didn't do the piece publicly until he got into Zen, but he had the idea before that point. This pre-Zen John Cage was a very interesting for me to read about in your book because I think in the popular mind, John Cage is so associated with the way he was post-Zen when he discovered that and used it in his own ways. What, what is most important to understand about how he was before he discovered Zen? Because we talk about, you just mentioned his, his, sort, of, his sort of left-wing crusader nature, but what, what, is, what, what is his nature before the discovery of Zen? Well, he was, he was more argumentative. He was, I think he did like to deliberately shock people early in his life. He, he didn't later. You know, he was interested in making music with percussion sounds, and that was kind of his primary focus. He was interested in rhythm. He had started out interested in 12-tone music and studied with Arnold Schoenberg, but reacted against all that, and... Um, it's a little difficult to figure out his relationship to Schoenberg because he seems more rebellious than he later uh, later let people know. But when he got into the when he got into Zen, his whole rhetoric changed, became much milder and kind of more nonlinear. And his you know people my age who knew him thought he was this this wise, calm, charming man. And I've talked to other composers who knew him back in the 30s and 40s had a very different picture of him. <laughs> I thought he was a little, little more of a rascal and, <clears throat> and kind of belligerent. So the change in his personality was pretty stark. How stark was the change in his music, in, in sort of an immediate sense? It sounds like he changed the way he acted fairly quickly. Did his music change as rapidly? 
Yeah, and uh, there's a re- real interesting transitional period between 1948 and 52. And before that, if you, if you listen to his music in the 1940s, people are often astonished at how calm and pretty it is. And he was, only, he was writing mostly soft music because he thought loudness equated to size, and size was bad because of, because of the corporations and everything. And then it was after 433 that he started, well, he got into, he, his first big chance piece was Music of Changes, 1940, uh, 1951, which he wrote just before 433. And so mo- what most people know about Cage is the music written after that point, which he, <clears throat> chance dominated his music for the rest of his life. So, yeah, there was one of the, one of the biggest transformations that any com- com- composer has ever gone through that he went through between 1948 and 50. Did he change as much during the rest of his life after that as he did right then? Was, or was that essentially, was that the mode he would remain in, more or less, for the rest of his life? Well, he changed, after that, he changed more gradually. He got more and more into music as theater. And the remarkable thing about Cage is how much he continued to be influenced by artists younger than himself. Because he was, he got, he was very close to Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns, and influenced a lot by them. And they were both uh, almost a generation younger. And also Morton Feldman, who was, I think, tw- fourteen years younger. And Cage's very last music, the music he wrote after Feldman died, sounds a lot like Feldman. And there's frequently been a connection drawn to that. He started writing this very very soft music of very long tones. And the harmonies don't sound like anything like Feldman, but the continuity does and the dynamics. So, What idea do we have of how he fit in to the world of composers back then? Of course, you mentioned he, he was hanging out with artists younger than himself, like Feldman, but also visual artists like Rauschenberg and Johns. What, how, was he considered by composers to be w- one of their own, or was he more of a general figure in the art world who could go where he pleased? What was, what was his status there? Well, I think he was kind of an outsider in the same way that Harry Parch was an outsider. Uh, he wasn't taken very seriously. The, the percussion music he was doing, I think, was seen more as a kind of interesting experiment or a prank or something. But his music was, and he's not the only person like this, his music was tremendously out of context for the 1940s and 50s because what was going on at the time, everybody was writing big symphonies, lots of brass. There was the orchestral rhetoric of the time was very noisy. And you had a few composers who stood outside all of this. One was Cage, one was Lou Harrison, one was Alan Hovannis, one was Harry Parch, and uh, all West Coasters, I guess, and sort of stood out, stood outside that dominant, very European-oriented uh, aesthetic and really sowed the seeds for the next era, I think because it wasn't until minimalism comes along that you start to get ideas from those people coming into, coming into a more dominant uh, style of music. I don't think he was entirely alone. I don't think he was taken very seriously, but I think he did have kind of a group to identify with. And if we leave out the artists, if we leave out the music students, if we leave out the composers, and we concentrate simply on the music listening world of the time, who would encounter the works of John Cage? Back then? Indeed. Back back then when, when he was he was around the time of four thirty three, let's say, who was who was who of the specifically the listening world was encountering his works? Well, I think there was a lot of interest from visual artists. The intelligentsia in general, I mean, Christian Wolf was the son, his, his sort of Cage's protege was the son of uh, two very important publishers. And they were, in, the, in fact, one of them was the, the man who published the I Ching, which is the Chinese Book of Changes that Cage would, would later base his chance music on. 
And so I think people like that in New York were going to those concerts. I mean, he did give some of his concerts in non-music-specific settings, like the Museum of Modern Art. And the art scene has gone on and off. The art scene, visual art scene has uh, always sponsored a lot of uh, avant-garde musical activity. I think that's less true uh, in the last 10, 15 years than it, than it had been for a long time. I want to go back to your own relationship with this piece. Now, you talk about playing it in the early 70s, but what was your first exposure to Cage and to 433? I heard Cage's prepared piano music on the radio on WRR FM in Dallas, where a guy named Steve Akternak played a lot of a lot of real up-to-date music. And so I heard these player piano pieces, bought those, and then I think the next thing I got was the Everest recording of Variations 4, which is a wonderful collage of radios and people talking and records and, and stuff like that. And about the same time, I got his book, Silence. And I'm pretty sure that when I performed 433, I had never yet heard a performance of it. I had just read about it. And so I kind of knew how it went. But, oh, and I, I bought the sheet music. Which is also depicted, of course, in your book as well. The viewer, readers can get a look at it. Right, yeah. So I, I, I went to Whittle Music and, and bought the sheet music for 50 cents. <laughs> which, which price is still on my copy. So I guess I, if, I, if I thought, if I performed it without actually having the music, I would have been uh, unethical or something. So. <laughs> You describe yourself getting into sort of the world of John Cage then, as you, you talk about reading his silence, you talk about his other pieces as well. And how much, obviously, getting getting to know what surrounds 433, the world of Cage, enriches enriches one's experience of 433. Although, actually, is that statement true? Am I right in saying that, that, that 433 itself is enriched by getting this sort of this wider view of what Cage was? Well, I think so. I mean, I'd, I would be curious to what, as to what people would think of Cage just knowing that piece. I mean, I, I think the public is, for, for a long, long time, the public is going to get kind of a negative view of Cage as a prankster because that's so many people think that about him, and he's been so often dismissed, and you really have to get into the writings and other music to realize how serious he was. Um, if the first thing you encountered of Cages was sonatas and interludes, you would get a very different view of him than you do from 433, but I think 433 is probably the, the piece people hear of first. How much did you feel an obligation in writing this book? Of course, it's a book about 433 in large part, but how much did you feel an obligation to get across that John Cage's work goes far beyond that as well, or is, is far wider than simply the four minutes, 33 seconds of silence? Well, what, um, what fascinated me was not so much the rest of Cage's work, but of all of the ideas that led him to 433, because when I started reading, there are a lot of people I have read because Cage got me interested in them. Uh, for instance, Ananda Kumaraswamy, who was curator of fine arts at Boston Museum, wrote wonderful books on Asian art, and I read those when I was very young because Cage talked about them. Uh, I read R.H. Blythe's books on Zen in literature and was fascinated by those. And so what interested me most was the amount of cultural material that comes together in 433 and the kind of intersection between corporate protest and acceptance of Zen and Eastern thought. The, the aspects of Cage's music that, that come together in 433, like the three movement structure and the, the chance derived times and everything, are not, not really that important. He used the same method to write 433 that he had used to write other piano pieces of the time, but since he was only applying them to silences, the, 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 the actual use of them was kind of trivial. But I was fascinated by how he 
started reading about Zen and Eastern thought in 1942 and went through this tremendous emotional crisis and sort of cured himself by reading all of this religion stuff. In fact, I was hoping that uh, writing about 433 at that depth might have a big impact on my own music, but which I think it hasn't yet, so maybe it will. <laughs> but do you foresee that coming nonetheless? I don't know. Um, in a way, writing the book, because I was very awed by Cage when he was alive, and writing the book sort of humanized him for me. It, uh, I, don't, I don't think less of him than I used to, but I, reading the books, I realized more and more how the, his, the books are so charming because he's so persuasive and such, a, such an elegant and surprising writer. It's not that he had some, that he had found some viewpoint that was going to change music or that you could switch to. And in fact, I think a lot of people get so intoxicated with his writing that, well, people call him a philosopher all the time. I don't think he was a philosopher at all. He was a, he just, he had a lot of preferences and he defended them very elegantly. And he got people interested in lots of ideas that were connected with his music. But I I sort of lost the belief that there's some kind of Cajun viewpoint that one can compose from because there was just nothing that consistent behind his thought. There was something consistent about his music. He was a composer, but he was not, he had not discovered a new view, viewpoint from which to rethink music, I think. Now, how much did, how much did John Cage have ideas to pitch to fellow composers, to readers, to whoever was his audience? And how much, and I'll, I'll make this argument, how much was he, how much was his work kind of an opening up of a space, rather, for people to generate their own ideas? Does that make any sense? It does. I think his, I think his part of his value was uh, suggesting that, that that actually music should have have much to do with everyday life, and that there was a lot going on in politics and architecture and uh, you know general cultural changes and religion and everything, and that that could could all be tied to music, and his music was relevant to all of that in a way that most music people's music hadn't been at the time. In a in a funny way. I think he, I think he didn't really change music very much. I, I shouldn't say that about 433 because 433 led to a lot of interest in ambient sound, and uh, it's had a big impact on electronics and, and everything. But I think recording technology might have had that impact anyway. I don't want to sound like I'm being in the, in the least dismissive of him, but in, in a way, I think Morton Feldman's music actually did more to change the way people can conceptualize music and the way people think about musical continuity. And as I, I've talked to, I've interviewed a lot of uh, younger composers about Cage for other projects, and it's kind of funny how little influence he's had, although everybody admires him, uh, everybody knows his music, but very few people have actually gone the way of, of randomness or non-hierarchical music that he, that he was into. Now, can we frame it this way in that John Cage has obviously had some sort of large influence, perhaps not directly on the composition of music, but what has he had a, 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 an influence on then? I think he inspired a lot of people to more directly connect their music with other disciplines. I think there's been a lot of interdisciplinary work because of him. I think the idea that music could be, re that religion could be relevant to music, that philosophy can be relevant, that, that there are things in common that, that the arts have, has created a lot of interest in interdisciplinary work and lots of collaborations and things like that. His, Music before 433 has had a certain small influence in terms of the kinds of rhythmic structure people use. 
But the chance processes after that, I think, were pretty limited in their influence to a few people. His personal influence was, was tremendous. He was so positive and so cheerful and so good at presenting himself publicly that you know, lots of young composers, myself included, have modeled ourselves after him one way or another. <laughs> you might say, and this is, this is just a terrible thing to say considering his, his anti-corporate early life, but that he, was, that he had the way of a certain type of salesman in that sense. Yeah. He found certain things fascinating and presented them very well. And, you know, as I, as I say in the book, I was so overwhelmed by his writings when I was a kid, I was sort of in danger of my, losing my own personality, and I had to kind of forcefully rest myself away after a while. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas. I'm Colin Marshall. My guest is composer, educator, and former new music critic at The Village Voice, Kyle Gann author of No Such Thing as Silence, John Cage's 4330. If you enjoy this interview, you might also enjoy some of the other musical ones I've done in the marketplace of ideas, including those with young ambient music composers Lawrence English and Ethan Rose, as well as the one with Jeremy Halladina, the composer behind The Mayan Cycle. You can find all those at colinmarshallradio.com, where the complete Marketplace of Ideas archive is kept. If you have any questions, comments, positive, negative, neutral feedback of any kind, send that along to colin, C-O-L-I-N, at colinmarshallradio.com. Now back to the conversation. I want to move a little bit back to this this fact of your book as an intellectual history as as well of the ideas that led to 433. Now, you mentioned that you had followed up on those earlier in life, of course, before writing this book, but how much how much was there left as far as the job of tracing back what what actual ideas, what sort of intellectual influences went into this? How far back does the does the the tree go, and how far back did you go into it? Well, I had uh, I had a lot of research to do. I sort of knew where the lines were, and luckily there has there have been there's been uh, a lot of fantastic research in the last couple of decades by other musicologists. David Patterson has written a lot about Cage's about the influence of Eastern thought on Cage, and he, his writings were very very helpful for that. And William Brooks and Several other people have done the legwork that I might have otherwise had to do. I had to go back and reread books by Kamara Swami, uh, get into Meister Eckhart more. The medieval scholar Meister Eckhart was a somebody Cage got got very much into for a while. Lou Harrison had found a book by a 16th century musician named Thomas Mace, who the Cage had used as justification for some of his ideas about about the purpose of music, and you know, I went I went back and read that. So there were some, but it was the, the nice one of the nice things about Cage is almost it seems like almost every book he read he talked about, and so you can collect all of those books, and it's a finite amount. You can really see where everything comes from. What are some of the most fascinating ideas for you personally that you did find in this journey of uh, assembling the, the John Cage shelf and, and reading what he read? What, what sort of s- strains of thought jumped out at you as just particularly interesting? Hmm. Well, one was um, Aldous, Aldous Huxley had written a book uh, comparing, a kind of a comparative religion book, and he talked a lot in that about the importance of silence and of prayer and contrast, explicitly contrasted it with all the noise and intrusive advertising we get in modern life. You know, in, in this day when we're coming up against the negative power of corporations in a lot of other ways, it's interesting to go back and see how, how people talk when they first became aware of that. Because, there's, you know, there's, there's, in the 50s and 80s, there's been a lot of corporate propaganda to convince us that the business of America is business and that corporations are, are benign, but uh, they were or initially seen as something very menacing back then, and not just by Cage. He was, he was far from alone in, in thinking that, that we had to combat them some way. 
Is it different at all in terms of, I mean, is, is it simply an earlier version of the same sort of anti-corporate thoughts we hear today, or is there something different in kind rather than in, in sort of chronology? Well, I think the, we've, we've become so inured to so many aspects of corporations. I mean, the amount of noise we put up with, the amount of advertising, the, you know, we, we've, we've got, sort of gotten used to this, in, to being intruded on. You go into a grocery store, and of course you hear music, nobody expects anything different. And today we're more aware of how corporations influence politics and you know, things that are wrong with the world because somebody somebody's making money off of having a war going or or keeping people from getting health insurance, things like that. So I think the the locus of it has changed a lot. I think in the nineteen forties they were just suddenly aware that that the world was changing and people didn't have much say over how it was changing. I want to talk a little bit about the fact that of course you as I mentioned earlier long time critic for the for the no, long time new music critic rather for the village voice for 19 years i believe and yep that that means a lot of time spent explaining things that are quite hard to explain musically to a wide audience yeah. to a public audience to a not necessarily an audience of composers what even even leaving aside the specific challenges of the, this book for a moment what are the what are the main what are the main challenges of doing specifically that, of, of describing, of talking about the importance of new music to those who are not embedded in the, that world themselves? Well, the kind of music I've always written about, I think, is easier to bring across than, say, something, you know, the more, the more standard kind of classical modernism, which might be very complex and, and atonal and built on, on pretty complex concepts. I've always have specialized in music and been interested in composers whose music was drawn from vernacular sources or elect, you know, common electronics, uh, things that, that people do encounter. Um, I've written, written about music that people play on uh, sort of hot-wired CD players to make collages or people that music that's made on boom boxes. So it's mostly been music that was not, whose relevance was not difficult to sell. Um, a lot of the music I write about is by people who think that, that we should not have this gulf between classical music and pop music, that we should have something kind of in between, or that you can bring vernacular music influences into a longer piece. And so that's been kind of a lifelong crusade for me, that we're trying, trying to make a classical music that's relevant to people, that is not some distant thing that you go here in a concert hall and sit there in rows of chairs wearing your best clothes. It's something you might hear on the street, something that people play in living rooms and lofts and, and things like that. So uh, I've always been kind of a populist in my sympathies and my advocacy which is not to say that I don't also appreciate a lot of really com really complex modernist music of the kind that puts people off in concert halls, but uh, I've kind of spent my life explaining the stuff that's easier to explain, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> now, the stance you have taken as a critic, is it is the stance you've taken as a composer similar? Are they, are they two sides of a coin, or I, I, don't want, I don't want to sound like some Jekyll and Hyde sort of thing here, but how similar oh, are they? They're, they're fairly similar, but music comes from the unconscious, and every now and then the composer, Kyle Gann, shocks the critic, Kyle Gann. <laughs> <laughs> they, they generally get along, but the uh, composer is a little unpredictable. And to get the, a third Kyle Gann into this, the, the John Cage historian we see at work in No Such Thing as Silence, that this idea you mentioned talking about as a critic or focusing on as a critic that this music should be something that is involved in involved in people's lives and not rarefied in such a in such a compartmentalized time and space how closely does that relate does it relate to cage's idea about music's greater integration with life itself yeah and uh and actually that came that came out of the eastern thought 
Cage was studying too, because Kumaraswamy resented what the effect that museum culture has on art, that they take art and put it in a museum and you go and just look at it disinterestedly and you can't touch or anything. He, he thought that in other cultures, art was a part of everyday life. People have art in their homes. People make art. Useful things are, are made artistically. And so he, he talked a lot about integrating art in life, and Cage got that partly from him. So it was a way of, of bringing into American culture this, this thing that is very, very common in, in non-Western cultures, that the art is just, you know, you have musical instruments in a house, they're beautifully made, they look beautiful, um, you know, your, your milk pitcher is beautiful, it's got designs on it, and that there's no big, no big distinction between artists and non-artists or art and the, and the other objects in your life. Uh, it was kind of a quixotic attempt to bring to bring that into American culture in such a way that we could absorb it. How successful do you think those ideas have been in gaining a foothold then since Cage was talking about them? Well, not very successful. Um, I mean, the ever since the 80s, Life in America just seems to be become more and more commercial, more controlled by corporations. Um, we're sort of going in the opposite direction, and I think Cage took a wonderful stand and inspired a lot of people. But but insofar as we're trying to create an artistic climate in America, you know, we're losing at the moment and have been losing for a long time. What do you think, if, if anything, do you think is a strategy to combat that sort of thing? Well, it's been, it's been my, my, uh, one of my beliefs as a composer for a long time that anything you do that does not involve the exchange of money is kind of subversive of the, of the, ruling corporate monolith or something, but corporations get really angry when things are changing hands and there's no money involved. I put my all of my own scores up for free as PDFs on my website, which is kyogan.com. When people record my music commercially, I take it off my website, but until until then I leave it on my website. And I think the the free economy that's growing up around the edges of the corporations is very, very devoted to combating their influence and, and trying to change the world. It's going to be, it's difficult to see how far, far it's going to get yet. But of course, it's a, it's a tremendous worldwide problem. There are a lot of, a lot of artists in Europe uh, consciously combating corporate influence and trying to do things outside the money exchange paradigm. You must be at least somewhat optimistic then about the sort of you mentioned putting your scores on the internet, but this the whole wider, the whole wider culture of free cultural exchange that the internet has brought about, the the kind that scares yeah. music corporations. That must make you a little happy. Yeah, I'm, I think there's, you know, there are enough people who are very savvy and, and know what's going on, but, you know, but but the corporations fight back. There's this move to you know, give larger corporations more bandwidth than smaller ones and make it more difficult to find certain people on the Internet who aren't contributing to the corporate culture and things like that. So you have to be very vigilant to keep them from, keep them from moving in. To turn back to Cage himself a little bit, this question I know is just going to sound, sound a, a bit grand, but it's something that I'm very curious about. You know, when you look around or when you listen around the modern world, where can you find examples of of, of what I'll call the the Cajun? You know, even if it's indirect, is do you do you identify in life just things that that feel as if they feel as if they wouldn't be quite the same had John Cage not done what he'd done and been who he'd been and you know, put out pieces like Four Thirty Three that have so reached into the public consciousness? Hmm. Well, one thing that Morton Feldman said Cage represented was that he asked the question, is music an art form? 
which is kind of an odd, maybe an odd way to put it, but the, I think the question is, as opposed, can music simply be a, a work of art rather than an entertainment? People expect most musical inter- performances to be entertaining in some way or another. You know, you go to a, you go to a show given by a songwriter, you go to a musical, and there is an aspect of music which can be just sort of ongoing without without necessarily without de- de- deliberately doing things to capture people's attention. So you have sound installations. You got there, you know, people in major cities all over the world who've got sound installations that you might or might not have notice as you're going by, um, you know, interest in ambient sound, uh, a lot of stuff on the internet where you can, you can tune in and listen to sounds from around the world or things like that. There's also a lot of interest in, well, or a lot more people these days for whom Zen and Buddhism and meditation are important parts of their, their artistic life and people who I think are trying to change the world by by calming it down in a sense, by getting rid of negative energy and doing work that leads to more of a psychic equilibrium. I think it's kind of connected to and parallels the, the attempts to make the planet more green and less wasteful of energy. Some of that certainly comes from Cage. Some of it would have had to happen one way or another, even without Cage. But Cage accelerated that for a lot of people. I know, you know, I was raised to have kind of a kind of a very rationalist, scientific worldview, and Cage's interest in Zen and astrology and, you know, non-Western thought made me much more open to the idea that there might be other other ways of looking at the world than the rationalist one. And I'm probably, you know, he, he really started that with me. He probably started that with a lot of people, and, and that's probably a little more pervasive than one could even realize at this point. And writing the book itself must have must have highlighted the parts of you that were that were altered or formed or influenced by Cage in just bright colors. They must have popped right out as soon as you were Im- embedded in his in his the world of his ideas and the world of the ideas that led to his. Yeah. Well, it's, there's, a, there's something I quote in there. He's got, in one of Cage's articles that I've I known all my life, he has this uh, question and answer thing with himself. He kind of interviews himself, and there is a passage in The Doctrine of Transmission of Mind that has a very similar interview, and I was kind of shocked to realize that some of the most original aspects of Cage came from him, him kind of taking over these these thought models and writing models from from Eastern scriptures and things. Yeah, the interesting thing for for all that I that I got obsessed with Cage in my late teens, I was already I had I had been a musician for a long time. I'd been playing piano since I was twelve and very much into Gershwin and Bernstein and Copeland and Roy Harris and Charles Ives. And so a lot of that, a lot of the bedrock of my music personality exists in those composers. And Cage was very persuasive and kind of took me off track for a while. And there's still things I, I love about Cage. The, the acceptance of accidents. Sometimes I'll start a process going in my own music and just allow accidents to happen and think, oh, that's nice. But unlike Cage, if I find one I don't like, I take it out. (laughs) The book, once again, is No Such Thing as Silence. John Cage is 433. Kyle Gann, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program. Oh, thank you. I enjoyed it. If you'd like to learn more about Kyle Gann, visit KyleGann, K-Y-L-E-G-A-N-N, dot com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I've been Colin Marshall. If you'd like to hear this or any other interview on the program again, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com. If you have any feedback, positive, negative, neutral, or otherwise, please do send it along. Any questions as well to Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. The website of our 
theme music guy, Ben Althaus, is available at benalthaus.com. Thank you for tuning in, and we will catch you next time.